Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Eddie Brock Week here on the Venom Vlog. And today we're going to talk about a story called Sign of the Boss, which is, I think, the one story in this trade paperback minus the Koba issue. The, the trade paperback being Tooth and Claw, uh, which you can pick up now on Comixology or in print as of the recording of this, uh, which is uh, June of 2020. So I don't know how much longer it'll be in print. I think it came out last year. So probably a little bit longer, hopefully, hopefully up until the second Venom movie comes out. Um, so if you're watching from the future, hello, welcome, and hopefully you can still find these books. You probably can on Comixology. I think they're going to be there probably indefinitely now, um, most likely. So, uh, so Sign of the Boss, so this is a story that was not written by Larry Hama, much like I think the, uh, the Koba minus one issue wasn't, but everything else in this trade is written by Larry Hama. So we get a little bit of a departure from his kind of wackiness. But not much. <laughs> Actually, I would almost think that maybe the story was written by Larry Hama. It's not, though. It's written by Ivan Velez Jr., who was the writer of Ghost Rider after Howard Mackey, uh, you know, left the book around like issue 60 or 70, somewhere around there. And um, Ivan was the writer uh, that wrote it until the end when it was uh, canceled around issue 92, 93, uh, roughly. And uh, and he's, you know, he's not bad. I liked some of his Ghost Rider stuff. It got a little weird. And I feel like, you know, he was definitely trying to go in a new direction. And he had like a different artist come in who had different styles. And they brought a different flair to Ghost Rider. And I appreciate that because they weren't just retreading and copying what Howard Mackey did. And Howard Mackey did such a great job. As you guys know, I have that entire run of Ghost Rider, every issue. I have every appearance, actually, Dan Ketch has ever made. So obviously, I had to own this. But it was funny, when I was going back through my collection, I was like, wow, I have Sign of the Boss issue one, but I don't have issue two. And I go, did I ever read issue two? So eventually, I tracked one down. I spent like 30 bucks on it. Like This was a couple years ago. Um, but uh, but I was like, yeah, okay. So someone wanted 30 bucks. And I think it was at Comic-Con. I was like, uh, so I went around and, and shopped for a little while and came back and was like finally caved in. So, uh, but I still, I did, I think I might've read it then, but I just forgot all about it. So it wasn't until, you know, this trade came out that I was like, okay, I can now revisit those stories in print and I don't have to take, you know, my, uh, my, you know, single issue copies out of the bags and boards because I'm very precious about my Ghost Rider run. I like keeping them bagged and boarded. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, anyway, so Sign of the Boss is a story, it's two issues, uh, that's it. It's a very short story. The art is by Tom Derenek, who I'm a big fan of. I like his style, and he does a good job in this. Actually, I thought he did a really good job on panel layouts and, and things like that, and kind of pacing and structure, I thought mostly were there in this story. So like the, the that kind of stuff you know, that I normally review on, I don't have major complaints on, but I will say the story does feel weird. <laughs> like, it just does. And uh, and I think this was another one where Eddie's eating chocolate uh, when he gets uh, hired for the mission. Maybe even, I might even have been misremembering. I think in the last episode, we talked about um, uh, License to Kill. And I think I mentioned him eating chocolate. I don't remember if he if that's from that one or if it's from this one. Now that I think about it, because I read these a couple days ago and now my memories are all jumbled. Um, but uh, but I think in this one he's also eating chocolate and uh, and he's like you know getting you know come people come in to uh, hire him for the mission. I think it's Agent Smith this time and someone named Agent Jones um, are the people that uh, you know kind of come in and, and try to recruit him. And what they want him to do is they want him to go undercover to this church uh, and they want him to dress up as a nun. And uh, Eddie Brock, you know, very big dude, uh, you know, they were like, we want you to dress up as a nun and go into the church, which you know what, I'm not going to slam him for. I myself have dressed up as a nun on Twitch one time. I said if I got 500 followers on Twitch, I would dress up as a nun, play Devil May Cry 5 demo and sing uh, songs from the, the Sister Act 2 soundtrack. And I did <laughs> because my I give my word and I, and I try to do it. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm not going to knock Eddie Brock for But that's something else me and Eddie have in common now. Uh, only he did it to, you know, go undercover to this uh, thing that was happening. So I guess this drug lord um, named Franco Santera, uh, he he's coming, he, he like runs a small country. And of course, he like oppresses the people there. He does all these terrible things. Well, now he's married to a woman named Marta and he's coming to the U.S. And he's basically saying like, hey, look, I, I turned over New Leaf. I met Marta, you know, and I found God, you know. So he's at a church giving this speech to these, uh, you know, the people of this neighborhood. And I guess he's learning to, you know, wanting to, He's like, hey, I want to come here to the States and I want to move into this neighborhood and I want you to know who I am and that I did have a bad past, but I'm trying to turn over a new leaf. And he's trying to do that to kind of convince this part of you know town by going into the church and talking to the people that, you know, um, that live in that area, you know, trying to give them, you know, like this bullcrap story, basically, because it turns out he's actually not a good guy. He didn't turn over a new leaf. And his wife, Marta, is just as evil and corrupt as he is. Uh, so uh, but they're just coming in. They're like, yeah, we want to, you know, take over this town now. I don't know why they had an interest in, you know, coming to New York to do something like that when they owned their own like small country or ran their own country but maybe things were getting tough over there and they decided to come over here uh there is a part where someone gives a bunch of exposition of why 
they do all this, uh, but it's so silly and and it feels very Larry Hama ish, you know, in regards to some of his recent Venom stuff. Like I like Larry Hama; he's a good writer on like GI Joe and Wolverine. Like I said, I like the stuff over there, but he got really wacky with Venom, and so this Ivan Velez kind of I feel like he's continuing that. And considering he's the writer of Ghost Rider at this time. Ghost Rider's not a major focus in this story. Uh, Dan Ketch is there. He's at the church, uh, and he's with a friend of his, uh, Melissa Marrow, I think her name is. And it, this is a girl he started to, you know, uh, become acquainted with around I Ivan's run when he took over the book from Howard Mackey. And so the two of them go to this church, and they're, you know, uh, talking about the neighborhood and how they want to, you know, help out and stuff because it's, it's you know, Dan Ketch's neighborhood, too. And so they're in the church and this guy's giving a speech and Dan catches, you know, being like, hey, can this guy actually, you know, could he actually be turning over a new leaf because he fell in love? I think that gives Dan catch some hope because he is the spirit of vengeance and he's had trouble with love um, and keeping friends and, and loved ones alive while being Ghost Rider. And he's done some things as Ghost Rider that he's not proud of himself and doesn't agree with. And so he's like, you know, is there hope for me if this guy can turn a new leaf and he's killed people and, and done bad things like, you know, but he's trying to do better now. Um, you know, maybe there's hope for me, but you know, Melissa, she's not really buying what the, you know, uh, Franco, uh, Santera is, is selling and she's right not to do so because it turns out he's lying. So in the crowd in the, uh, you know, the people sitting in the pews and stuff at the church, uh, a bunch of, uh, armed guys stand up in the middle of Franco's speech and they pull out guns and they're firing them. And, uh, you know, they're making him look, uh, like he's being attacked on, but you or you know, like looks, makes it look like those people in the, in the crowd with the guns are attacking him. But that's not the case. This is all part of Franco's plan. Him and Martha decided that, you know, they're going to, you know, uh, set up base here in New York or in this area of New York. And what they're going to do is, uh, you know, they're going to go and they have like uh, planted men in the crowd firing at them to make it look like they're um, actually good people, that they're victims now. And uh, and that these people are from their past and that they, they, you know, part of his past crime life. And they're like, no, you're not gonna turn over a new leaf. Like they get up and they have their guns. They're like, you don't get to be forgiven. You know, you're a bad person and you know, blah, blah, blah. And I guess it's to build, garner him sympathy. I don't understand the plan myself. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I kind of get it, but it's kind of silly. And then meanwhile, you know, Eddie's already uh, in the church. He's downstairs with the kids and like other nuns and they're doing like a, you know, Bible study, you know, while all the parents are up in the actual mass and stuff. And so, uh, so they're down there and then the kids get attacked by this guy comes in with a gun and Eddie knocks him out <laughs> and reveals himself uh, to be Venom and in front of everybody. So that was kind of a cool thing. There's also a, a, pri uh, a priest. There, there is a priest there, um, and I can't remember his name, Father or something. And then there's Sister Marianne. And Marianne, she's one of the other nuns that's helping Eddie with the kids downstairs. So Eddie turns to her and he's like, hey, you know, guard these kids. Here's, you know, the guy's gun. Make sure no one else comes down here. I know you're a nun and, you know, you're not supposed to kill people or whatever. Uh, but make sure you keep these kids safe. I'm going to go up and see what's going on upstairs. And so Eddie goes up there. So this is what the agents wanted to put Eddie here for. They knew something was up with Franco. And so they planted Eddie here, you know, that morning so that he could be there when Franco gave his speech. And it turns out what the agents felt was going to happen was exactly what happened. I thought you could have got the exposition from the agents. Maybe they figured out that Franco had this bullcrap plan and you just got your exposition from them. That would have made sense. But instead, they have this other character in there called Tarek. Uh, Terachnid, <laughs> Terachnid, who's this guy who, like, in the crowd of, you know, normal goons who stand up with guns, this one stands up, this one person stands up, Terachnid, takes off his trench coat, and you see that he has, like, eight spider legs, and he's, like, a, you know, like a, ro like a robot, half human, half robot. It almost, like, reminds me of a Reaver from the X-Men, um, only just a spider version, like a spider slayer version of him. Um, so, anyway, Terachnid stands up and attacks, and then Venom fights him, and the two go at it. I think in the in the brouhaha, uh, the uh, you know the because Franco's like, no, this wasn't supposed to happen. Like, why is Venom here? What's going on? This is ruining my plans. And then that's when uh, the priest accident, you know, someone shoots him on accident, and the priest gets wounded. So he's kind of bleeding out through most of the story. And that's so that's the ticking time clock, right? You got to have those in some of your stories. It's a story point and structure. It's like, all right, we got to save a life. And so the priest is slowly dying. And Eddie, I think, even has a point where he says, "Hang on, Padre, I'll help you in a second. And you're just like. <laughs> okay, like, all right, at least he acknowledged it, I guess. Uh, but then as Eddie be starts beating up Terachnid, 
that's when Dan Ketch, uh, cause he gets knocked out really early in the story. Someone hit him in the back of the head with a gun uh, while he was Dan Ketch. So once he gains consciousness, he turns into Ghost Rider and then he attacks Venom. And then that's, that's at the end of the first issue. So most of the second issue is them fighting each other and Ghost Rider trying to do the penance stare on Venom, which we know from, you know, from the, uh, I think it was a uh, Spirits of Venom storyline, the crossover with Web of Spider-Man and Spirits of Vengeance. Um, that storyline showed that the penance stare actually doesn't work on Venom. It doesn't work on, as long as the symbiote's covering Eddie's face, the, in, you look into its eyes, it can't be driven mad by the pen and stare, which is really cool. You can't re, because uh, that's what the pen and stare is for those who don't know. Ghost Rider looks into your eyes and he finds your sins and then he kind of replays them over and over where you are the victim as opposed to like, you know, like if you killed somebody, let's say you stabbed 20 people. So in your mind, you, you would relive the death of those 20 people, but as the person that, you know, so you'll see yourself stab, you're like seeing it through their eyes. So you feel their pain as they die and you get that kind of played over and over and over. So it's a really awful thing and it drives you mad and eventually you just go catatonic and, you know, then you just get put into Ravencroft or somewhere else, some other, you know, place that uh, deals with people who just can't talk anymore or communicate anymore uh they just lock you away you know put you away in a, in a home somewhere so uh so it's it's pretty terrifying so it never worked before so i guess ghost Rider figured that out because i'm trying to figure out is this con like is, is this ivan paying attention to that continuity or not is he doing it accidentally like i couldn't figure it out but there's a scene where you know ghost Rider in this new iteration he actually does the pen and stare like through a hand mark on your face so it kind of changed from just the, the basic stare. The stare's still there. He does it to like kind of uh, freeze you in place. And then he puts his hand on you and the hand burns, you know, like your sin, like a handprint on your face and your sins play back in your head or something. So he's using his hand that's on fire to separate the symbiote from Eddie. I understand the point of that, but if I'm not mistaken, the hellfire from Ghost Rider also didn't hurt the symbiote previously. I mean, maybe that's, you know, again, maybe writers aren't paying attention to that stuff uh, sometimes because I, I think there's been instances where the Hellfire has hurt a symbiote and then there's been instances where it hasn't. So it's hard to, you know, you know, pick a side there. I feel like there's been an equal amount on both. So I don't know if one of you guys feel like you have a, a stronger answer than I do. Feel free to let me know down in the comments. Uh, but so anyway, he's trying to, he pushes the symbiote away and he's going to, you know, face palm Eddie's face and actually do the penance stare on him. And, uh, but then Eddie says, you know, fine, do it. But, you know, I've done some bad things, but I'm trying to do better. And I, every day I try to do better. And, you know, he gives him like this sob story and then Ghost Rider just buys it. <laughs> Ghost Rider goes, okay. And then walks away. And I'm like, ah, oh, like, I wish they would have played with that more because to me, that doesn't feel like a Ghost Rider decision. Like Ghost Rider would have still done it. Like, you know, you can't really reason too much with Ghost Rider. But Dan Ketch, considering that line at the beginning where he's, you know, he was like, is there a chance for, is there a possibility for second chances? And is there one for me? If the Franco had one, obviously we find out Franco Sentara is a bad guy. So the second chance thing doesn't work on him. But, you know, Dan Ketch still feels like maybe, you know, I, you know, he wants a second chance. So when Eddie says that, I'm like, maybe the Dan Ketch side of Ghost Rider is the one that gave him a pass. But I feel like they should have shown that more because that would have felt like a more solid setup and payoff. Because uh, otherwise it just kind of feels vague. It feels like Ghost Rider himself walks away from Venom and gives him a pass. And I'm like, well, I feel like Ghost Rider wouldn't, but Dan Ketch would. So I kind of wish they played on that a little bit more. Then Tarachnid, who got knocked out by Venom, he stands up for like two pages just to give exposition. He stands up because I got to get to Santerra. He like, you know, uh, he's he's my boss and we did this together and, and this is our life together. And, you know, and he's he's a friend of mine and I, I, I support him. And, you know, we were supposed to come in here and attack him and make it look good. And then and then, you know, get, you know, I don't know what their I can't remember what their full plan was, but they had a whole thing planned out. So Tarachnid stands up and just to nobody doesn't say it out loud or nothing, just thinks in his head what the plan was and how they got to this point. And then all of a sudden, um, I think Melissa comes up behind T Tarachnid, uh, Dan Ketch's friend. And she comes up with like a fire hydrant or something and hits him in the back of the head and knocks him out. So he literally was in the battle in the first issue. And then in the second issue, uh, was out for most out cold for most of the Ghost Rider Venom battle. Then he stands up to deliver to the reader only uh, all this exposition. So it's not anything like news that the characters learn or nothing like that. It's literally just there for the readers to learn. And then he gets knocked out instantly. And so you're like, okay, so he stood up to give us exposition for two pages and he gets knocked out. It's, it's, 
you know, I, I, a lot of times I think people sometimes wonder where my, how I review things and they're like, oh, are you just looking for story or, and it's like, yeah, story is a big thing. If the story is fun and good enough to me, I overlook other things. I'm full, I'll fully admit that. Like if I understand the purpose and the setup and the payoff and their structure, I overlook some of the things that I, I get hypercritical on. But when those things don't pull me in and lock me into the story, then all my hypercriticalness comes out. So just so you guys understand, because I've seen people before go, oh, you gave this a pass and not that. It's like, hey, look, these first of all, these are my opinions. You know, you don't have to agree with them. And if you have a different one, I always encourage you to talk down below so we can have a conversation. Uh, but I just understand that about me. If the story is fun enough and it pulls me in, I'm lenient. You know, like I, I other things kind of get a pass because I was entertained. And that's where the fan side of me comes out. And then the editor slash writer side of me, um, that, you know, comes out more if the fan side of me isn't satisfied. Uh, so that's probably the best way to describe how I discuss and review things. So uh, so in this story, and then there's also another character named Stigmata, and she was originally uh, assigned to watch Franco Centera. You find out at the end of the story that she's actually some kind of angel being that was sent by the Vatican and uh, to see to make sure Santero was on the level. But the, the Vatican didn't believe he was because of all the crimes he had done. So they sent Stigmata undercover. Uh, so uh, so when, you know, friend, uh, Santero at the end, when he's, you know, ready to, uh, you know, face the penance there from Ghost Rider, Stigmata raises up. She has her angel wings and she helps out and she pushes, uh, uh, you know, Santero into Ghost Rider and Ghost Rider does the penance there on um, Santero. So uh, so that's pretty much the story. I mean, it's two issues. It's I don't know. I felt like it could have benefited from a third issue and they could have fleshed some of the stuff out, shown some more of the background. Uh, but for whatever reason, they were only given two issues to do this book. And uh, and that's a bummer because I feel like this is an OK story, but it could have been better. But it, and, and the thing is, when I mean OK, it's because it, a lot was crammed in in these two issues. And I feel like it just needed a little bit more room to breathe. And it could have probably, um, you know, been a better a better book. Or if you only had two issues to do this, I wouldn't have done this story. I just wouldn't have had it set in a church with a guy trying to, you know, that's too much plot. It's like, it's like that's what this book suffers from is it's plot, 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 plot. And you're like, okay, but like there's no room for real character stuff or, or, or any cool moments really. Like, you know, you just kind of throw everything in there because you're trying to squeeze in a Venom versus Ghost Rider battle. And then you get this Tarachnid character and Stigmata and the Vatican's involved. You have all these things that like, I don't know. They some of them tie into, uh, you know, uh, Ivan uh, Ivan Velez's uh, Junior's, you know, his Ghost Rider run. Some of it, but again, that's what I feel like. I feel like Larry Hama, Ivan, like sometimes they they, they got you know invited on to do these books, and they're like, all right, let's bring stuff we did from other books into it, and it's like, well, that's fine, you know, because I guess you want some cross pollination, hoping that people will go read your other stuff. But there wasn't a lot of, you know, mess, you know, normally editors will go, oh, this happened in this book or, or we're referencing this. And, you know, to follow find more about Stigmata, go check out this book or whatever. There's really none of that in there because most of these characters you never see again in comics. Uh, so so it's just kind of like whatever. Like it felt like, you know, maybe Ivan was setting something up uh, to use in other stories and and then this, it never paid off, really. So this book kind of feels like a mat to me. It's just it's just whatever. It's fine. It's not it's terrible. It's not, you know, but it's it's nothing great. I mean, that's the thing about this tooth and claw book as a trade paperback as a whole it's tough it's it's tough to recommend i would say you know if you're a venom fan you should probably own it because you want probably want to own everything venom but if you're a casual venom fan reader i would say you could probably skip a lot of these stories that we've talked about uh, for the most part i do still encourage you guys to go make up your own mind though don't take my word for it a lot of people disagree with me on stuff so totally cool go check it out for yourself and make up your own mind uh, but if you have read sign of the boss uh, you know let me know what your thoughts are down below obviously at the end you know uh, you know venom goes back to the agents and they're you know they're like all right we're gonna have another mission for you really soon which that mission is going to be in this book which we'll talk about in the next episode which is called the venom agenda it's a standalone like 48 page book by larry hama and art by tom lyle rest in peace tom lyle uh, die, uh passed away you know died a few months ago from a brain aneurysm and uh, as you know i'm a brain aneurysm survivor and so hearing that really broke my heart because he was one of my favorite artists growing up as a kid so i remember loving this book as a kid but now as i reread it as an adult i remember why i loved it it's definitely tom lyle's artwork and it's definitely not the story uh for sure and we're going to get into that in the next episode so this is going to be another larry hama downer one uh but uh, we'll have some fun i'll bring the toys back and you know you guys can see uh some reenactments from our friend wiener schnitzel and uh, he'll do some reenactments of the battle in this book uh with spider-man and venom so that'll be in the next episode so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on that and again let me know what your thoughts are sign of the boss just kind of a mass story for me but maybe it's different for you so if so let me know down below we'll continue our conversation down there thanks so much for watching the show as always like share subscribe all that fun stuff and i'll see you all in the future peace